the Hawaiian Islands, filled with beautiful and diverse habitats that contain many species found nowhere else on Earth. And several of these species are in trouble. I'm Travis, and I'll be your guide for exploring the decline of Hawaii's native forest birds, avian malaria, and how scientists and the Kauai Forest Bird Recovery Project are preventing and studying the disease. Many factors are contributing to the decline in Hawaii's forest bird populations. Loss of habitat, climate change, invasive species, but none more than disease. Avian malaria and avian pox virus are spread by human-introduced mosquitoes. Historically, mosquitoes did not exist on Hawaii and native bird species never developed resistance to mosquito-transmitted diseases. Because of this, mosquitoes have devastated many native bird populations. For example, here on the island of Kauai, both the Akikiki and Puaiohi have less than 500 individuals left in the wild. These individuals and many other forest birds once had a large range across the island, but are now restricted to living in high elevation areas where mosquitoes cannot live due to colder temperatures. This small area is the Alakai, and this rainforest is the last safe haven for birds on Kauai from avian malaria. However, due to climate change, these cooler safe havens are warming and mosquitoes are now encroaching on these areas, further threatening the forest birds. But this is where we come in. We're the bird's last line of defense in the rainforest. And for the next few months, we'll be living and working in the Alakai to determine mosquito abundance, avian malaria prevalence, and to work on methods of diminishing the overall mosquito population. All this will be done by three different procedures, mosquito traps, stream surveys, and mosquito pool treatments. Let's get to it. Each week starts with a long hike into the Alakai. The views along the way are like none other in the world. And it's all part of the job. Once in the rainforest, the sites become smaller and closer, like the friendly elapayo. The elapayo is the most abundantly seen bird here due to its tolerance to avian malaria and its curious nature. At the beginning of the season, all our supplies, equipment, and food is flown into camp, which allows us to begin our first task, setting up mosquito traps. Traps are set up in a grid around a targeted stream in the Alakai. We will be conducting most of our work around a specific stream, so to protect its exact location, I picked a random one for this aerial example. Each trap site is hiked out to while carrying all the trap equipment. The streams become our highways for the next several months as they are the fastest way of traversing through parts of the rainforest. It can be a bit dangerous and tricky walking in the stream, so the buddy system is in full effect. Once the trap location is found via GPS, a tarp is tied up for rain, and we begin setting up the two different adult mosquito traps. Yeah. All right, so this here is our BG trap. This is going to attract females that are looking for a prey. We have the CO2 right here. This is our bait. This is pumping CO2 into here. And as you know, CO2 is uh, what animals exhale and what mosquitoes are attracted to. We also have a stinky stick, which it smells a bit like um, stinky feet. It also tries to attract them. So how it works is the CO2 and this stinky stick will bring in the mosquitoes and then this fan in here will suck them into this bag. And that's how we check them. While I set up the next trap, Theo will explain the type of bait we use for it. So what I'm pouring right here is some grade A stinky water. So gravid or pregnant females seek out water that has decaying or decomposing plant matter in it. So what we do is create a, a hay infusion with yeast and a couple other enzymes, um, and it brings them right into the traps and uh, we collect them in the morning. Here's how we use it in the traps. And this is a rider trap. This is going to attract the pregnant females. 
or looking to lay eggs. So we dump the stinky water in, and the stinky water will attract the females with its stinky smell, and they will want to lay eggs in the water. But as they land on top of the water to lay their eggs, the fan will suck them up in this black tube and then into this net. That's how we catch them. In the late evening, the trap fans and CO2 is turned on and left on overnight when mosquitoes are most active. When morning comes, we can begin checking the traps for mosquitoes. Each morning, we hike back out to all the traps that were set the prior evening. Nothing in that. Three mosquitoes, here we go. Booyah. Before I aspirate the mosquitoes, let's jump into some quick IDing. Currently, there are only two species of mosquitoes making its way into the Alakai, Aedes japonicus and Culex quincu fasciatus. The Culex have solid colored legs and a white or tan abdomen, while the Aedes are easy to pick out with their white striped legs and dark abdomen. But it's the Culex species that we are after. They are the carriers and transmitters of avian malaria. The mosquitoes are sucked out of the net with an aspirator. And yes, there is a mesh in the tube to keep them from flying into our mouth. They are then gently blown into a cup for transport. To determine malaria prevalence and mosquito abundance, all mosquitoes caught during the week are kept alive and hiked out on the weekend where they will be shipped to the Big Island and tested for malaria. So I need to keep these mosquitoes alive. In order to do that, I need to mix up some sugar water and then put it in this little cotton ball and then they can drink the sugar water out of the cotton ball. So, I don't know if you knew this, but mosquitoes don't survive on sucking people's blood. Normally, they're nectar drinkers. They drink sugar water. The only time they go after blood is when they need a big extra boost of protein for laying their eggs. Because these mosquitoes were caught in our BG trap, it means they are most likely reproductively active females attracted to the CO2 and looking for a blood meal. So males and females not looking to reproduce will be drinking nectar. Maybe that should keep them alive. When we finish checking all the traps in the morning, we can then start looking for mosquito larvae by doing stream surveys. But first, a little exploring. The stream is broken up into 10 meter sections and mosquito larvae habitat is thoroughly looked for in each section. Stream surveys are done routinely as a way to standardize looking for mosquito larvae pools and to make sure we check every possible area along the stream. Dippers are used to sample the water and look for larvae and any aquatic insect found is identified and recorded. Mosquito larvae require stagnant or very slow moving water to survive in. So we're mostly on the lookout for small pools next to the stream, like these ones. These small rock pools have larvae in them. However, these are 80s. And if you recall, we're after Culex species. Here's how we tell the difference. The mosquito life cycle consists of adult, egg, larva, and pupa. Here in the larval stage, the 80s and Culex look very similar, except for the siphon. The siphon is a tube that allows the larva to breathe air. It's like their snorkel, and the Culex siphon is much longer than the 80s. Here they both are in a pipette. It's a bit difficult to film such small individuals, but you can just make out the difference in siphon lengths. So far we've found plenty of 80s pools, but 
No Culex pools. Nothing. Uh, nothing. Nothing. Nothing again. Nothing. And as the season goes on, we check traps every morning. Do stream surveys during the day. And replace batteries and CO2 tanks as they get used up. And yes, when it rains, we still work. And sometimes, it never stops. It can be overwhelming at times, but we endure throughout the field season. Well, I forgot my rain jacket. And it's raining again in the rainforest. Who would have thought? Who would have thought? Breakfast in the Alki Swamp. The rainforest seems to have stripped away every sense of humanity in Stephanie. <laughs> She's resulted in eating pork jerky for breakfast. <laughs> I like pork jerky. <laughs> Was this week four? I think so. Halfway through. More than that. Well, to be fair, I've been having pork jerky every morning. <laughs> <laughs> Broken on day one. <laughs> All right, so this is camp. This is how we dry a lot of our stuff. Uh, we use the exhaust from the generator. So that's fun. This is the uh, Weatherport dinner and breakfast table. Tonight, Stephanie's cooking. Nice stew of chicken and rice and green beans. Because we just serve greens. Yes, we don't eat very many vegetables out here. <laughs> so this is our drinking water that we get from the stream. If it looks brown, that's because it is. It's extra brown this week because of all the storms. Nothing wrong with a little dissolved organic matter. So here's the weather port. A little dark in there to show you inside. So this is inside the weather port. Theo's taking his daily ibuprofen from all our terrible hikes. It's not true. <laughs> um, yeah, this is where we keep all our food. These action packers down here keep all our non-canned food safe from the rats. And the rats are everywhere, especially on Theo's bed at night. And then uh, this is the other end of the weather port. This is where we all sleep. Nothing fancy here. That's it. The Akikikis are insectivores. Here, one enjoys a caterpillar. With less than 500 individuals, the Kauai Forest Bird Recovery Project monitors them by color banding adults and fledglings to determine survival and distribution rates. Having such low numbers, it's imperative to monitor them and try to reduce as many threats as possible, such as rats, non-native birds, and of course, mosquitoes. During a routine stream survey, Theo awkwardly suggests I check for mosquito pools up this thorn-infested drainage. I oblige. Ow! Jeez, oh, Pete! Yep, Culex. Second and third. Those are the instars we're looking for. Yep. Ow! Ow! Okay. <laughs> we have a Culex pool we can treat now. And actually, we've found several more of them. Mosquito pools are treated with BTI, Bacillus thuringiensis israelensis. This biological control is a bacteria found naturally in soils and specifically targets mosquitoes, black flies, and fungus gnats. Extensive studies have shown that it has little to no effect on any other species. Because of this, it is used all over the world and is sold commercially and publicly. You might have seen it in stores as mosquito dunks or mosquito bits. 
Here's how it works. Once in the water, the bacteria is ingested by mosquito larva. Inside the larva's midgut, the bacteria releases a protein crystal. The crystal dissolves and releases a toxin that will only bind with specific receptors on cells of the mosquito's midgut. The toxin then forms a small pore in the cell, causing the cell to fill with water, expel its contents, and burst. All cells in the midgut burst and the larva dies. And since the toxin only binds with the receptors found in mosquitoes, fungus, gnats, and black flies, it does not harm any other animal, plant, or human. This has been tested and proven in different environments around the world, but those results still need to be replicated here in Hawaii before BTI can be used regularly. And that's just what we're doing. Before the pool is treated with BTI, we need a population estimate of all the aquatic organisms in the pool, as well as a nearby control pool that does not have Culex in it. In each pool, 100 dips are taken systematically, and any organism caught is identified and counted. Here's some of the things we catch. Three copepods. Copepods are very tiny crustaceans. Dragonfly larva, called Ashnidae. Two micro. Microvilia, which are very small water striders. Eight micro, one megalagrian. And megalagrians are damselfly larvae. When counting mosquito larvae, we are also noting what instar the larva is. Each development stage after molting is known as an instar. The fourth instar doesn't eat much, and the pupa doesn't eat at all. So optimal conditions for BTI to work are pools with first, second, and third instars. After the 100 dips, the pool is treated. 24 hours later, both the untreated control pool and treatment pool is sampled again. One micro. And just as suspected, all the mosquito larvae are dead and other organisms unaffected. Here, a megalagrian is actually enjoying the free meal of a dead Culex. Another 48 hour, 72 hour, and week sample are done to make sure all mosquito larvae are gone and other organism populations stay the same. And this brings us to the end of the season. We did our best, but there are some obvious drawbacks to the traps and pool treatments. There are many places we simply cannot set up traps and areas with adult mosquitoes that we cannot find. That's a lot of flies. And BTI treatment is limited by the fact that not every mosquito pool can be located. However, there is an alternative option for large-scale mosquito control. And once again, it's a bacteria, Wolbachia. This naturally occurring bacteria lives in symbiosis with many insect species, including Culex mosquitoes in Hawaii. Hawaii has several different strains of Wolbachia, and different strains are incompatible with one another. Meaning, if a male mosquito mates with a female with a different strain of Wolbachia, the resulting eggs will not be fertilized. Therefore, if lab-bred male Culex mosquitoes, which don't bite, were given a strain of Wolbachia, then were released into the wild and bred with wild females with a different strain of Wolbachia, no offspring would be produced and the mosquito population would be significantly reduced within one generation. This phenomenon is already being implemented in Florida and California to help prevent the spread of other mosquito-transmitted diseases. Also, Wolbachia can only survive in insects and cannot transfer to other animals. Currently, the University of Hawaii and Department of Land and Natural Resources are researching this future opportunity, but will first need full government and public support. Maybe one day invasive mosquitoes will be under control in Hawaii. It would give these birds a chance. But until that happens, nonprofits such as the Kauai Forest Bird Recovery Project will continue fighting to keep these birds alive. I'm Travis, and thanks for watching.